So what's left to say about Bobby Moore? That's what I was wondering when I spoke to the sports journalist Matt Dickinson. He's written the latest biography of the West Ham and England captain. Norman Giller, Jeff Powell, who were friends of Bobby's, well, they written books about him previously. Matt's take is a different one, written from the perspective of someone born after the World Cup 1966. We did. Good memory. When I heard you had written this book, I thought Jeff Powell's done a book, Norman Giller's done a book on Bobby Moore. What was there left to say for you to say about Bobby Moore? Well, I mean, with no sort of disrespect to those guys at all, I think an awful lot because I think, you know, when I think of my generation, and if you'd have asked me who writes about football for a living, what do you know about Bobby Moore? I would have dis distilled it to, oh, revered captain, World Cup winner, died terribly young. And to be honest, I don't think I'd have said anything really about the character or the man or what he was like or what, you know, what challenges did he face. Um, you know, was he a straightforward guy? Was he a complicated guy? And I, I just didn't feel I knew anything about Bobby Moore the person. And, and the more I looked, the more there seemed to be to find out because he was quite secretive and he, 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 his life was more turbulent than people know. But he kept that private, and that was what I found fascinating. So you were born, I don't know, post '66. Yes, just. So is this for your generation rather? Well, than no. Mine? I hope. I mean, in some ways, one of the nicest things, the nicest compliment I probably had about the book was from someone, a, a, a very experienced reporter who lived through those times, reported those times, and he sent me a very nice note just saying, "Look, I was there. I saw all this, and I've learned so much from your book because." And this comes back to Bobby's secrecy. I mean, I think the, the, the probably the classic case is the testicular cancer. Yeah. You know. Um, here he was, you know, life-changing ordeal. And this is 64? 64. 64, before the World Cup. And he goes absolutely to every length to keep it private, to the extent that even one of his close friends told me, oh, you know, it's not true, that cancer story, because Bobby never told me. Well, Bobby didn't tell anyone, and that was his nature. But some pressmen knew pre-66. Well, they certainly knew he had a groin problem, different versions of whether they knew it was the, the full cancer, whether they knew it was the full surgery. But the fact is, it didn't come out until after he died, and uh, that was just one example, you know. And then there's the why did he fail in management? Why did he end up in obscurity? Why didn't he get a knighthood? Um, but he was too nice to be a manager, surely. Well, I think that again, that's really interesting. What you know, what we think about Bobby Moore, we think of him as a great captain, but actually, you know, we have an idea of what a captain should be. But from my research, he turned out to be probably one of the quietest captains England have ever had. He wasn't this sort of warrior, fist-pumping leader, and. While we love that in him as a captain, it was probably his failing as a manager. He wasn't a communicator. Um, so just trying to trace you know, what worked for him in one, one section of life, but that actually was a failing in another part of his life. What are your impressions of the man post-writing the book? Because I have to say, at that point you paint a picture of a quite cold, distant man, and I have to say he's not the man I had dealings with. Yeah, well, it's interesting. I mean, I think there were various sides to him. I, I mean, I think, you know, he was... Um, could be incredibly generous, could be incredibly warm. He had, um, I think, the perfect combination, I guess, of being a superstar and never acting like a superstar. So, you know, absolutely, I, I think, well, I hope that I very much um, brought those you know, qualities to the light. But at the same time, you know, both wives, they talk about the, the, the sort of distance that he kept. The fact that, you know, they shared his most intimate moments. But I mean, I described that scene where Bobby's diagnosed with terminal cancer and he's in the car and, and Stephanie, his wife, you know, understandably in, in sort of hysterical tears. And Bobby's reaction is, is not to cuddle or to, to ask her how she is. It's to literally open the door, climb out the car, close the door and walk off because he couldn't deal with that kind of overt emotion and, that, and that, that makes him an interesting man to me. Okay, but on both occasions, the testicular cancer in the 60s, the bowel cancer that sadly killed him, he could never use the word cancer, he could never discuss it. No, exactly, and that's, you know, there's a heroic stoicism about him, which, you know, I think, you know, people sort of talk about, you know, that sort of uh, English stiff upper lip, and he, he had that. I mean, he was incredibly, clearly brave guy, very self-contained. Um, but again, I think that just, it opens up a lot of questions about someone when they're that contained, doesn't it? What, what are they really feeling deep inside? And I, you know, I, I'm not saying I've come up necessarily with all the answers, but I just thought that was an interesting question to pose because I think we've we've always had this slightly superficial, glossed over feeling about his life, and I just wanted to try and delve with it. And you do mention in the book, and you talk to Stephanie, his wife, the widow, about it. West Ham Football Club, for whom he was their greatest captain, um, are to this day as I read it, not making any donation to Bobby Moore, funds set up in his name yeah. for cancer. 
despite the fact that we know how wealthy those people are who are running West Ham and the fact they've effectively been donated a new stadium by, yeah. the, by the taxpayer. It's bang wrong, is it? Well, it is. I mean, they, they uh, I've had to, since the book obviously caused a bit of a flurry of controversy and then they've been in touch and they're now saying that we've set up a community foundation in Bobby's name with um, Tina and Roberta Moore but as things stand there is no financial contribution to the fund. They say that they have an awareness day um, but given that the BM6 stand, given that his you know, image is everywhere, given that he's used on the tickets, given that there's a marketing slogan more than a club, I don't think it's good enough and, and I have to say the feedback from West Ham fans has been that the club should do more. Let's talk specific games now, just through them. Um, to your mind, what was his, I mean, it's like you say you weren't born then, but to your mind, what was his highlight? What was his moment? Was it 66? Was it 65? Cup Winners' Cup with West Ham? 17? Well, I think the, the videos I watched, I mean, I thought the 65 Cup Winners' Cup final is fascinating just because he's everywhere. I mean, one minute he's left wing. Um, you know, it's the real insight to me about the range of his game. I think the 70 game against Brazil it has to be the, of all the games which was the standout for me. I mean, here you're talking arguably a better England team than 66 against one of the greatest teams of all time. And even in that company, Bobby Moore looks absolutely top class. You know, he looks like he could play for either team. He looks like he would be at home um, in, in the Brazil team. He looks brilliant. Um, in, uh, uh, so I thought that was fascinating. Although it's funny, I mean, again, one of the hopefully interesting parts of the book was that if you ask Moore himself, he might pluck up something like the 64 semi-final, FA Cup semi-final against Man United. He was the underdog young team. Did they have the potential? And this was a day when, thanks to Bobby Moore, um, they beat the great Man United with best law at Charlton and went on to win the FA Cup. So he might choose a slightly different occasion like that, away from Wembley and the great international matches. Was, was Vision his greatest asset as a footballer? I think so, yeah. I mean, it was fascinating for me, again, not you know, having lived through those times, but the the switch from a back three to a back four just as he is making it big in the game. Ron Greenwood sees this role for him as this sort of loose, spare centre half. And I think that seems to be absolutely key from what I was told, is that because, of, you know, he'd been actually a bit of a sort of jobbing defensive midfield player a lot of the time. And this role, of man marking wasn't his thing. And, you know, this role allowed him to sort of step back a bit and to see the game and to see what was in front of him and to use that perception. You taught me that Cluffy wanted him. I mean, his passing from West Ham, Bobby Moore's passing from West Ham was not was a bitter one. Yeah. But Cluffy wanted him at Derby. Yeah, I think. I mean, he says that was one of the greatest regrets. Um, you know, him and Ron were interesting in their massive mutual professional respect, but personally, they just didn't quite click. You know, reserved uh, captain and reserved manager doesn't necessarily make for a, a particularly warm relationship. And, and Bobby found Ron very frustrating. Wished it handle the team differently, wish to give him more praise. I mean, very, Harry Redknapp told me a fascinating story about, you know, Bobby saying, you know, every player, even me, needs a well done. It doesn't matter if you're a World Cup winner. And, and Ron didn't do that. So they, they had a, yeah, a, a very difficult relationship. And again, to me, that, that was all new and fascinating. What was Bogotá 1970 all about? And the jewellery? I think the setup. Uh, you know, spoke, there's all kinds of different uh, versions of this of this story. Um, one that has sort of gathered a bit of steam is this sort of was it a prank gone wrong? One of the other England players. Now I spoke to half a dozen people who were, who were there, um, on and off the record, insistent that nothing went on. The fit up um, incidents that happened before Bobby and after Bobby. It strikes me that this is Julian shop on the make and um, believe me I did everything I could to track down the, the woman who accused him. I, 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 had a, no I, think, I had an investigator in the United States trace, trying to chase her down. I've you know, got a social security number for everything. I mean I, 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 I like to think I've left no stone unturned but as, as, as near as damn it I, I'm sure that it was a setup. One thing I'm absolutely sure about is that Bobby Moore did not steal a bracelet. I mean you know again his nature the last thing he's going to do is something as rash and reckless as that. We know Jeff Hurst scored a hat trick. We know Jeff Hurst got that final goal. They think it's all over, etc. But who passed the ball? Yeah, it was, that was, I, I mean, I've heard Jack Charlton tell this story in, in, in the flesh, and it's a wonderful story. It made the sort of hairs on the back of my neck stand out, where you know you've got Jack Charlton screaming at Bobby Moore, "Get rid, get shot, just hit, you know, boot it anywhere." Rose Ed and Bobby Moore, being Bobby Moore, the immaculate ball-playing defender, does a little one-two in his own penalty area, and then hits that pass. I've always it made me feel sorry for, 
for Bobby Moore. I mean, he's, he's revered, but the, the, the footage doesn't it always show just that bouncing ball, Jeff Hurst striding forward, lash, goal. No one ever shows the pass, and yet that pass probably sums up Bobby Moore as well as the Jairzinho attack. Congratulations. Well done on the ball. Thank you very much.